This is the most amazing book ever. Three out of the four stories I would highly recommend. The third one is by my favorite author ever, Maisie Yates. It's fall. We're going to read the thank you letter and, of course, the letter from Grandma June. To my amazing friends and authors, Caitlin, Nicole, and Jackie, this project was joy because I got to work with you on it. And I'm thankful not only for your talent, but your friendship. Without you, who would I send raccoon GIFs to? You all are truly the best. Fall. Here's the letter from Grandma June. Dearest Lila, it's a very strange thing to get old to know that eventually the world will go on without you. To see clearly your successes and your mistakes and still not know what you could have done about either. You, my head in the clouds girl, how I missed your imagination, your spirit bright, brightening my summer days. I know this autumn will be hard on your soft heart of yours, but the simple truth of life is that one can never wish away all the bad or the hard. Sometimes a girl has to roll up her sleeves, make an apron for a chicken tea party, and find her spot in the real world. I have many things of you to ask this autumn. You'll hate most of them, and they'll test all of your skills you doubt yourself on. But you'll always know that if you can organize the Red Sleigh Holiday Bazaar, you can survive anything. Let my spirit guide you in all that you do. Let this house take care of you as it always cared for me. And I have the utmost confidence you'll find that anchor that you've been searching for. Love always, Grandma Ju. Those are always the hardest pages to get through. Okay, on page 285 to 286 is our first little bit that we get to read. Lila knew about her mother's relationship for Grandma June and had fractured long before Lila was even born. But for as long as Lila had known her grandmother, she had been trying to fill the cracks. Whatever had happened way back then, she also known that ben, she was good to Lila, and she always tried to reach out to Lila's mom, but that hadn't been enough for her. She had been hypersensitive to Lila's relationship with Grandma June, and any mention of the farmhouse or June created drama with, that Lila didn't like being in the middle of. She had no time for drama, not now, not drama from her mama, and not drama in the form of Everett McCall, not that he cared about her at all, or he even thought of her, but for her, thoughts of him would always be tied to Jasper Creek. The last time she seen him, she had made a ridiculous fool of herself. She had been 17 to his 27, and her tearfully confessed her undying love to him on a potluck one hot summer afternoon. Okay. Not just a generic potluck. The potluck had been the thrown it down at the river to celebrate his engagement. His engagement to a woman who is very much not her. It was one time she broken her rule about confrontations. Thankfully, he had not returned the sentiment, and if he had, she would have lost respect for him forever. Really, the kind of man who would run off with a teenager at his own engagement party was not the kind of man that you would want returning your declarations of undying love a thing that now she knew at the ripe old age of 24. It hadn't felt like a good thing at the time. The pain and the humiliation had faded, but when she came to stay with her grandma, she avoided town and town get-togethers. She helped with the chores in the yard, clipped flowers from the garden, and enjoyed the freshly made strawberry lemonade with berries from the patch out back. She stayed for a week, and then she would leave, and then managed to avoid the cowboy that had ground in her heart to pieces beneath his boots. She stayed for a week and then she left and managed to have, okay, we got that part. She would be avoiding Everett McCall until she left here at the end of November, if she had anything to say about it. It should be easy enough. The man was the definition of a dude. He was certainly not going to get anywhere near the red sled, and maybe Tanya, his wife, would. But seeing Tanya wasn't going to hurt her. It wasn't like she was still in love with him or anything like that. Maybe, just maybe, he was the one an only thing that stoked the fires of her passion, and maybe that was the reason that she hadn't quite been able to... Maybe it was the reason that her dating life was a little bit of a non-starter. He probably had a beer gut by now. He probably had gone bald. Yes, men like him had a very short shelf life. Hard bodies did not stay hard forever. That was just a fact. And now she was done thinking about Everett. Or was she? Page 289. Let's see if I marked where I said to start in at. Doo, doo, doo. 
A flash of movement caught her eye, and then she saw a little gray cat pick, pricking through the dry weeds on the other side of the fence. Kitty, she said, kitty, kitty. There you are, a familiar and booming voice said from behind her. The cat bounded off and Lila froze. Just the sound of that voice sent shivers all the way down her spine and caused something warm and not entirely unpleasant to put a pull in her stomach. Everett. She recognized that voice seven years later without even a visual. How annoying. Grandma June had been close to McCall family, and Lila had grown up with that starry-eyed crush on that much older Everett, but she had been a fool then, and the sad thing was she was still a little bit of a fool now. You're not foolish. You're optimistic. It's not like being a pessimist makes you any better. No, that was true, but then pessimists probably didn't confess their undying love to remote and unreachable men in public spaces, and she had most definitely done that. Yes, she said, picking up her zucchini-laden basket and clenching it with both hands. She steeled herself, taking a breath before turning around. He will be ugly, she said to herself. Maybe he has a wart on his nose. Maybe he has a per peg leg. She turned around, and her stomach crashed down into her boots. Oh, there had been no way to prepare her for this. Even with a wicker basket held tightly in her hands like a lifeline, she felt like she might become unmoved by the earth and float away into a clear fall sky. Everett McCall had somehow taken his good looks and multiplied them at least tenfold in the past seven years. Granted, Lila herself was much better looking than she had been when she was 17. Her face was no longer round and youthful, peppy, puppy fat, but still had her improvements where nothing compared to his. He seemed taller, which she knew wasn't true because he had been 27 the last time she'd seen him, but he definitely and most assuredly broader. He was wearing black cowboy hat pulled over his low, pulled over his eyes low, but she knew exactly what color they were. A blue not unlike the sky that she had been pondering falling into, and she had to wonder if that was a coincidence or if that was, in fact, related to Everett McCall's eyes. In addition to the cowboy hat, he had on a snug black shirt with those three buttons at the neck and the long sleeves, and although his arms were covered up, she could still tell that years of manual labor had only served to increase his physical strength. His jaw was square, the whiskers of the chin darker, and his hands were larger, and she was sure of it. Neither leg was pegged. Drat. Of course I'm here, she said. My grandmother asked me to be. I would do anything she wanted. "'Except come back to visit more often,' Everett said, leaning against the open gate, his arms crossed over his broad chest. "'That galder. "'I came to visit quite often, actually, Everett,' she said. "'It's just that I didn't look at you, or look you up when I came. "'You hadn't been more than two years. "'Don't think June didn't tell me every time she came by with a jar of preserves or some zucchini bread.' "'He looked meaningfully at the basket in her hand.' It just so happens, Lila said, that I'm going to make some, but it's not for you. His wife could t make him some. That was not Lila's job. It's for the ladies who help run the Red Sled Holiday Bazaar. If you don't know, I'm planning it this year. My grandmother left me that responsibility. She flashed him a grin. And take that. She was not young, impetuous, irresponsible Lila Pauline Frost anymore. No, she was dedicated, responsible, creative, and cheerful Lila Pauline Frost and Everett and his mysteriously compelling disapproval were not going to change that. I do know, he said. His tone was going very grave. The red sled is being held at my ranch this year, and June just didn't ask you to plan it. She asked me to help. And that was page 290, 291, and 292. We're going all the way over to 296. So hold on to your hat. I told you this one's going to be a long one. Bella, he tried to think back to the troop of girls that had descended on June's every summer when they were kids. Not sure I remember Bella. Oh, she and her mother quit coming around when she was a teenager. He and had that vague memory of a small, sullen girl with wide blue eyes. I might remember Bella, he said, but I'm not here for Bella. I was sent here to talk to you. You were sent? I was. June let me know that she wanted you to be involved in planning the holiday bazaar. I've been hosting it the past few years. You don't seem like the type. To enjoy a holiday bazaar, I mean. Felted animals and spiced cider are a bit fanciful. 
Then she bit her lip and looked away. He couldn't read that expression. I don't know what I'm the type to enjoy a holiday bazaar, but I am the type to accept space rent for the use of my barn. All right, fair enough, she said. Why are you muttering, he asked. I just, I don't see why Grandma June would have put two of us working together. He frowned. Why not? She blinked, clutching her basket, which was filled to the brim with all kinds of vegetables he'd rather not eat in a lifetime, and gave him an owlish stare. Because of our history, she said. He arched a brow. Our what? I, the last time we talked to each other at your engagement party. He cast his, he cast his mind back. He didn't let himself think about the warm summer night seven years ago all that often. It had begun the beginning of a long, painful train wreck, where everything he spent his life fighting to become had suddenly been seen as wrong by the woman he married. And he bent and twisted his whole life to find a way out, to find a way to better. And she wanted him to leave it all behind, to be more fun, more flexible, to consider moving away from Jasper Creek if it made him so unhappy. Unhappy, like happiness had much to do with his life and getting through it. So the last time you saw me was at my engagement party, and, and I humiliated myself by confessing my love for you, she said, utterly de deadpan. I am traumatized by it. You? You did? You did? He said. He could remember that, now that she mentioned it, but only a little bit. She had pulled him aside and quite earnestly said to him that she loved him. He felt, well, he thought it had been a sweet, actually, and he didn't think much was sweet, but Lila had been a sweet presence at June's every summer, and as Everett gotten older, he had a hard time letting go and enjoying par playing with the other kids. He'd been focused on the future, on figuring out what he was going to do to find a life with more stability than he, his parents had. But when June's farmhouse had been full with her granddaughters, with the Matthewson's boys, sometimes the laughter had been bright enough that he'd been able to join in for a while. So yeah, Lila saying that she loved him had seemed sweet, like a good omen, really, because if Lila could find some affection for a guy like him, then maybe he was more than just being a boring, steady rock. But she had been a kid. He sure as hell hadn't thought she loved him in that way when he loved his fiancé. Lila had always been fanciful. The word just used for the holiday bazaar fit her to a T. It had been cute when she was little, slightly annoying when she was a teenager, but nothing he had given that much thought to overall. Do you not remember? The words were half-whispered squeak. It was my engagement party, Lila, so I mostly was focused on that. Her hands dropped to her sides, the vegetable in the basket bouncing slightly. She looked, well, she looked enraged. He didn't have the best track record with women, but this was the angriest he ever made a woman in such short span of time. You don't remember? Now that you mention it, I do, but I haven't thought of it. No. That was, she put her hand to her chest and looked past him, and he was feeling that she wasn't standing in his space and time at all. That was the most devastated I have ever been in my life. He went out of his way to avoid stuff. He married young to avoid it, and here he was being accused of hurting her when he hadn't done a damn thing. I'm sorry. He didn't mean it. My heart was broken. You still seem to be standing, he pointed out. Her vo face contorted, and he knew that then he had spoken with what kind of unfailing practicality that his ex-wife had despaired over. Unfailing practicality that wasn't sensitive or romantic of any or any of those things that his ex had wished she, he would magically transform into after they married. Everett was a man who had grown up on a farm. There wasn't much space for frilly sentiment in that, in that life that they had. If crops froze, then there was no money. And if there was no money, then there was no food. Handouts from the church pantry or from the government were beneath the McCall family, and they were not something his mother or father would accept. Better to go to, whip to bed with growling stomach than wounded pride. Everett's father had been a farmer, one of the last holdouts on a family farm without fancy machinery, and fields rented out by fat cats in money, monkey suits, quote-unquote. He had been a man who had worked the land that they owned for generations the way that his father-grandfather had done. No innovation, no invention. 
Everett had wanted more than that, because while his father had fancied himself the soul of practicality, Everett had found the kind of sentiment that he found the man clinging to a land that was becoming increasingly less profitable, the antithesis of real practicality. His father was sentimental. Everett had gotten into horses. His old man had rolled his eyes at that, but Everett had known that there was up-and-coming money in certain breeds, and he'd found a way to get his ground floor by buying into Irish cobs before the value of them skyrocketed. And now he was one of the premier breeders in the United States. That equaled money. But he never put all his eggs in one basket, which was also why he had eggs, beef, and why he rented out his barns to events like the Red Sled Holiday Bazaar. Okay, it's 290, 291, 292, 296, 297, 298, 299, 300. Okay, we're going to be going to page 303. He was also financially secure, so his ex-wife could dog on his practicality all she wanted, could talk about happiness and fulfilling dreams and whatever else she'd been convinced was missing from their lives. But he didn't go to bed hungry. Not anymore. A man could love the land and still go to bed full. Everett believed that, and he lived it for all his sins, and apparently he was sinning greatly now, at least at the eyes of Lila Frost. I can't believe you don't remember it. She still wasn't looking at him, and he had to wonder if she was yelling at him from seven years ago. I have literally been avoiding you for the past seven years because of it. I come back to this town and scamper between stores with my head held low because I'm afraid that I'm going to run into you. Well, you didn't have to do that, he said. Apparently, she snapped, drawing her basket in front of the tramping back toward the farmhouse. He followed right behind Lila up to the front porch, and the board gave way beneath his foot. He frowned. For all that Cade Matthewson oh, was over here with your sister, I would have thought he would have fixed this front porch. Lila whipped around. Cade Matthewson? That's who she's with? Did you not know the details? She stiffened. I don't know much of anything about J.J. I see. It appeared that he wasn't the only person that Layla avoided. Yeah, me too, she said, sounding weary. I'm going inside, and I'm making zucchini bread. We need to discuss that red sled, he said. June left me a list. Lists, Lila said, the word dripping with disdain. I hate lists, and I don't like you very much right now. Join the club. I'm sure there are t-shirts. She paused, narrowing her eyes. Who else is in that club? Well, you, though I hate to break it to you, but Tanya is probably the founder member. Your wife? He chuckled. When you go into avoidance mode, you really avoid. I've been divorced for two years. Didn't June tell you? Her lips twitched. Funnily, Lila said. Your name didn't come up that often or ever. Oh, did it not? Sad for me. So sad. Layla said, I'm sorry about your divorce. Yeah, me too. She's not. I don't really know what to make of that, any of this. I've been avoiding you for years because of my embarrassment, and also partly I felt partly uncomfortable about, uncomfortable about it because I knew that you were happily married, except you aren't. No, I'm not. Maybe I'll make you some zucchini bread then, she said, sounding terribly long-suffering. Well, in that case, maybe I'll fix the board here on the front porch. I guess you can, she said, if only because I'm certainly not going to fix it, and maybe Bella is coming in after me. You aren't sure, though? I told you I'm not. Nobody's really sure about her. So do none of you speak? He shook his head. I really have a hard time imagining that. You all seemed so close enough back then. Well, that was back before that last summer when Bella left and J.J. become impossible to talk to. Carol lost in all of her drama with Remy. But Kira and Remy are engaged now, he said. Yes, Lila said, and I'm invited to the wedding, so I guess there's that. Do you have a falling out with Kira, too? No, I think Kira had a falling out with Jasper Creek. Well, with Remy. And as the result, the town. June said you still came to visit. Of course I did. I was avoiding you, not her. I honestly still didn't realize you were avoiding me, and I didn't interpret what you said to me to be a confession of romantic feelings. I was engaged. There's nothing wrong with making sure people know your feelings, she said stubbornly. 
He disagreed. There were a lot of things wrong with making people sure knew your feelings. There was no point, first of all, people are going to do what they are going to do, no matter what your feelings were. An old stubborn man was going to be allowed a disease to eat away at his body rather than to go to a doctor, leaving his wife saddled with a ranch she couldn't afford, and a kid she didn't have the energy for. Stubbornness, stuff-necked idiocy, masquerading as practicality. Emotions over reality. I'll never know, he said, why people rage against reality. Because often reality is terrible and hope is much brighter. And causes you to go into hiding for the last seven years. Fix my porch, Everett, she said. I'll pay you in bread and then you can don't have to put up with me and my hope any more than is strictly necessary. Sounds good to me, he said. Now where can I find a hammer? Can you tell why I love this book? She is such a talented writer. I love the banner between these two. We're going to page 315. Everett parked his truck and Lila bounced out before he could go and open the door for her. Then she was into the shop and ahead of him in a flurry of movement as she gave her name and all the details of her order and handed a small stack of papers a moment later. She paid and Everett Bailey Everett barely had time to tip his hat to Tim, the owner of the place, before they were back on the street. We should walk, she said, and the way that we can canvass the whole town. I thought you were brought me to help you limit the canvassing. Well, I suppose so, but I haven't been downtown in ages. When I come to visit Grandma June, I, she trailed off. I'm going to miss her. I already do. June was one of a kind, Everett said. He wasn't very good at comforting people, particularly women, but he would miss June, too. And he knew well enough that sometimes the only way to help people with grief was to let them know that you shared in it. I don't know that she was an optimist, Lila said, musing, but she was determined, and in the end, that's almost the same thing. She never gave up, not on anything or anyone, and I always admired that in her. Page 316, 317, 318, 319, 320. Are you an optimist? Yes, Lila said cheerfully. I'm an optimist because pessimism does not produce a different result. Just a different attitude on your journey. She looked up at him. What are you? A realist. She barked out a laugh. Right. So you're a pessimist then? Nope. She stopped standing in front of a little corkboard that was hanging on the side of one of the little cafes. In my experience, pessimists tend to think that they're more realistic. When in reality, the odds that things turning out badly aren't actually any better than all the things turning out well. Absolutely untrue, he said. In many cases, it's pretty apparent how things are actually going to turn out. Right. Doom and gloom? Not at all. But look, avoiding things doesn't change the outcome. Wishing for better doesn't change the outcome. The only thing that changes the way things work is action. There are things you can do and things you can't do. I guess pessimism focuses on all the bad things that you can't change. And in my mind, opposites optimisms often engage in blind hope without doing much. A realist does what needs to be done. Okay, so you are a practical soul, she said dryly, moving on down the street, her heel catching on one of the cracks in the weathered sidewalk. She made an exasperated sound, but traipsed on. Why are you an optimist? Why not, she asked. It seems to me that you always were blindsided by bad things. I've never been blindsided by bad things. What will be, will be. You're a fatalist, he said. Maybe, she said, but a cheerful one. I don't believe in fate either. If you work hard and you work smart, you can make things better for yourself. If you go to a doctor when you have symptoms of a disease, you might even be able to have the disease be cured. Sitting around hoping it's nothing bad isn't going to help you. Sitting around knowing it's bad and doing nothing won't help you either. He shrugged. If you die because you didn't go to a doctor, that's not fate. I suppose not. All of it skated a little bit too close to his actual life, and he didn't need to be talking about his dad. Well, it's not like I like doing nothing, she said. I do. I just don't see the point of doing it with a bad attitude. Are you little Lila Frost? Both he and Lila turned, and a small older woman standing there, her hands clamped in front of her and a smile on her face broad, Everett knew that it was Linda Anderson, and he didn't know if Lila did. Yes, Lila said, returning the smile with equal breath. I am. 
So you're June's granddaughter, the one she put in charge of the red sled this year? I am. We were all so sorry to lose your grandmother, dear. She was truly one of a kind. Yes, Lila said, that her smile turning wistful she was. But I'm sure you'll do a wonderful job running the bazaar. I sell handmade jewelry, she said, very popular. Last year alone I earned a thousand dollars with my booth for the local school. I would really love to have my booth be number seven. Oh, well, the booth reservations open up in two weeks' time. All the information's on the flyer. Never mind that, Mrs. Anderson said. I just thought I would make it clear how important my contribution to the red sled is and how much I like booth number seven. Lila's smile stayed firmly fixed. Well, two weeks. The information's on the flyer. Mrs. Anderson reached up and took the flyer that Lila had just freshly tacked onto the board and removed it. She folded it up and put it in her handbag. Thank you, dear. I will keep that date in mind. The older woman crossed the street while leaving Lila standing there, staring after her. What just happened? I believe they call that being railroaded. She took my flyer. She probably wants to make sure that she's the only one who knows when the booth registration opens up. You weren't kidding, she said. Do I look like someone the kids? She turned and faced him. I guess not. I don't, for the record. No kidding doesn't fall for, from the realist code. She took another flyer off the stack and pinned it back to the bulletin board. That's just a taste of what's to come, he commented. Well, she said, just well. Still think you're not going to make that list? Her expression turned fearsome. I will not make a list. She's just the beginning. After that, Lila became extremely cagey about the hanging up the flyers. By the time they reached the coffee house at the end of the main street, she was hunching over her task. He might have left if he hadn't known that all of his cesareanist to small town psychological warfare. And Lila was not local enough to deal with it. Oh, sure, she might have spent scattered summers in Jasper Creek, but it wasn't the same as being a local. Before they left the coffee shop, she got her some insanely oversweetened concoction that she called a breve, which was explained to him as was made with half and half instead of milk. He stuck and tried and true black coffee. As they walked back to his truck, Lila and all her success, and he and his jeans and long sleeve black shirt, he felt like their personalities might have been written across them for all the world to see. She, with her bright hair trailing yards of fabric and excessive beverage, he with his, well, nothing other than his strictly necessary. I'll drop you back at the house, he said, then we'll go get back to the truck, but I have to go about my business. They got into the truck together, and suddenly he became aware of how cramped the trunk cab was. What is your business? Irish cob horses, he said. What does that mean? You train them, eat them, teach them to do dances wearing toe shoes? No. Then explain to me what you do. They began to drive back toward the farmhouse, and he found himself counting the seconds until he deposited the chatterbox off where she belonged. I breed them. They're very versatile horses, good for showing, good for cart pulling, just in general and all around great temperament. They become an incredibly sought-after breed. That's interesting, she said. Your father owned a farm, didn't he? Yep, and he died poor. And it was clear to him that Lila had no idea what to say to that. I didn't intend on dying with an empty stomach, he said. Right, so not a passion project for you. He shrugged, as much as of any, one of any, well, this is where I'm from. I love the land, I love the community, the people in it. I imagine that I would raise a family here. Right. I don't want to get off on a banker or a doctor. School was beyond my us financially anyway. It's not like I would have been good enough grades to justify anyone giving me a scholarship, so I figured I had to find something that I could do connected to the place in the land. She paused for a beat. And you don't think you're going to raise a family here anymore? I don't think I'm going to raise a family here anymore. Why? He shot her a glare. Just because you got divorced once, she pressed. How many times does a man need to get divorced to find out marriage doesn't suit him? Did marriage not suit you, or did she not suit you? Optimist, he said. Realist. Pessimist, she insisted. I don't bend, he said, and I don't know how to make marriage. And in my experience, it requires a lot of bending, and I couldn't do it. She left. That sounds like an incredibly abbreviated version of whatever actually happened. His expression shifted to something sort of resigned, and Lila recognized that look. People often got it when she was tenaciously digging for something as if they knew they had been beaten. She didn't feel guilty. 
She thought that working the land made him miserable. She thought living here made me miserable. That I worked too hard. I didn't have enough fun. She thought I was consumed with getting the place off the ground and being successful. She wasn't wrong. She thought we could pull up stakes and go somewhere new. She didn't want my kind of life, and in the end, I didn't want her kind either. Well, you think that's the kind of stuff you talk about before you get married? Tanya was local as they come. I didn't have any damn clue she might want to live somewhere else, and she didn't know that a life on the ranch would make her miserable. The fact is, Lila, we both thought we knew what each other wanted. We were as ready as two people could be for marriage. Still didn't work. Well, then, she wasn't the one, Lila said resolutely. Don't believe in the one, he said. How can you not believe in the one? Because that's magical thinking. It's reality. Two people get married and either they can bend enough ways without breaking and, and they can become a pretzel into some kind of life together or they can't. Tanya and I couldn't. It made me ask a lot of questions about whether or not I actually ever wanted to. Lila frowned and right then they pulled to a farmhouse. I don't think that's true, she said softly. What, my experience or my marriage? Oh, I'm sure your experience of marriage was the experience it was. I'm not sure your conclusions are correct. Have you ever been married, Lila? She shook her head. No, because I haven't found him yet. How do you know he exists? He has to. Everyone has a glass slipper or the person that can change them from a frog into a prince. Life is not a fairy tale, he said. Not if you don't want it to be, she said. I think you have to at least believe in magic a little bit to have some in your own life. I don't believe in magic, he said. I believe in hard work. That's it. He stopped the truck and Lila had sat for a moment before getting out. But he didn't feel relieved, not like he thought he should. No, instead he felt like she'd taken some of the air right out of the cab of his truck with her, making it difficult for him to breathe around what she had left behind. And as he watched her walk into the house, trailing scarves and sweaters in her wake, he wondered if Lila Frost was a little bit of magic herself. At the very least, she was the only person he ever met who made a case for it. Oh, this is such a good book. So we're moving on to page 326. <laughs> Sip of water. I told you this one is one of my favorites so I'm guilty for reading most of Maisie to you. <laughs> she jerked the door open and was completely surprised to see a t not a tiny old woman but a very la large cowboy. All the women had been coming to talk to her about being booth number seven. She did her best to calm the sudden uptick in her heartbeat. Are you here about booth number seven? I am not, he said. She growled and stepped to the side allowing him entry. I take it you had visitors. His gaze was behind her on the side of the table full of goodies. I did, and I want you to know I nearly sold my scruples for a couple of those felted mice. He stared at her blankly. He was handsome, even when blank. I don't understand any of the words in that sentence, and I'm not asking you to help me. She growled and stamped into the kitchen. I had some questions for you. You know, she said, there's a thing called a phone, and that means that you don't have to suddenly materialize in the middle of someone's house every time you have to tell them something. I don't have your number. June's landline? Well, she used to yell at me, tell me I lived not 50 paces down the way, and there was no reason for me to startle her to death with a telephone call when I could easily pay her a visit in person. Different times, Lila said. I would prefer someone send me a text so that I don't even have to be startled by the sound of their voice. See, he said, this is the kind of thing I don't get. People think that I'm antiquated, but they can't even have a conversation anymore. Do you consider yourself a sparkling conversationalist, Everett McCall? Hell no, but I sure as hell know how to speak with someone face to face. A realist with a smartphone. She said in a fake lament. I never said I didn't have a smartphone. Do you? Yes, it's a practical way to keep tabs on potential buyers for my horses and to update listings and the like. Right, the practical sound of reason. How quickly I forget. Would you like cookies? I'm drowning in them. Yes, he said. As a matter of fact, I'd love some cookies. 
326, 327, 328. Now, why are you here? She asked, trapezing over to the side table and picking up a plate. I have some questions for you about the vendors. I'm going to need to figure out exactly what I have to provide. Sometimes there's a requirement for power supplies and the like. If Ace Thompson is coming over with beer from Copper Ridge, then I'm going to need to help him with a setup because it's getting pretty complicated. Beer? She affected mock shock. What kind of wholesome family fun is this? The redneck kind, he said. Well, I'm not sure that I know that I talked to... I did write it down. Frustration bubbled up from inside her. She wanted to do this on her terms. Grandma June had asked her to do it, and she knew she could. She hated that she was forgetting now. It was Everett's fault anyway, standing here being distracting. You have a list? I don't ha need a list, she insisted. I think you need a list. I don't want to need a list, she said. She huffed into the kitchen and went back to the binder. I have some notes. That's not the same. Why exactly don't you want a list? Because I'm not JJ, she said. She was overreacting and she knew it, but she wasn't sure how to stop it. I'm not organized, practical JJ, and that's why my father took her instead of me. Because I'm a disaster. An explosive, messy disaster. And I have been since I was a little girl. I had the temer temerity to cry when I fell and scraped my knee. My room was always a mess. I left stuffed animals and dolls everywhere. And I never cleaned up after my tea parties. Her issues felt so perilously close to her surface here, in this farmhouse, doing the task that she was so, fr frankly, so far out of her comfort zone, and it made her want to run back to safety of Portland and Burnside Blooms, where she never asked to be anything but creative, and where she didn't have to try to sketch herself. Didn't have to try to be something or someone she knew she never could measure up to. A person her father might want. I knew you were when you were a kid, he said, his voice even. You were not like that. I was, but it's fine. I don't care. I'm me. I can't do anything about it. I am who I am, and I'm sorry if everyone seems to think that I should be something else, except Grandma June. Is that what you think? Grandma June is the only one who believed that I could do this. No one else would ever assign this to me. They would have thought that I was mess it up, but I'm not going to. I'm going to do it my way, and I'm going to do it with my whole chicken tea party given self. Grandma June knew me, and she loved me. My dad didn't want me. My mom drove me insane. I'm still not sure that she lost the draw to get J.J. I bet they fought over her. If they'd been thinking, they would have traded weeks off with J.J. and shunned me off to somewhere else altogether. Everett didn't say anything now that her temper was cooling lightly. Lila felt silly. I kind of proved my own point, she said. You know, there's a lot of ground between being asked to be changed and keeping a list to make your own life easier. Okay, so we've done 322, 326, 327, 328, 329. Whew. And believe it or not, this one's going to keep going for a while. Page 330. Is there? Yeah, I would say that all the ground in the world between those two things, he said, says the man who's already told me his marriage fell apart because he didn't want to change. He regarded her for a moment, his eyes stormy. So you're telling me that nothing in your life has been made harder because you refuse to do something an easier way out of sheer stubbornness? I'm an idealist, she said. Another IST for you to go with your grand self-claims. You're really going to stand there and lecture me, he said. You, the girl. Yes, girl, who confessed her love for a man at his engagement party. Something inside Lila wanted to snap. Well, I was right, wasn't I? I mean, let's face it, Everett, you certainly should have married Tanya. Couldn't have married you either, he said, given that it would have been against a few different laws and that I'm into women. Well, you still made a marriage mistake, didn't you? You were wrong. Maybe that was it. Maybe I was your sign and you were supposed to listen to it. Or maybe you were just some silly little girl and I took what you said as the word of a silly little girl. She walked forward and slapped her hand hard against the center of his chest. Damn, that was a lot more rock solid than she even expected. Well, I'm not a little girl, she said, and in case it had escaped your notice, I'm a woman now. And my observation is still that you're a stiff-necked, stubborn asshole 
who has no right to stand around and judge what I do or don't do, given the state of your own existence. Okay. 331 and 332. Then we're going to take a time out because I've got to get a Benadryl. My nose and sinuses are starting to bother me. Suddenly she found herself trapped against his rock-hard chest, his arm wrapped around her, and she didn't know what was happening. Her heart was thundering hard and pulsing between her legs, pounding heavenly. He was angry at her, and she probably should have shouted at him at manhandling, all things considered, except it didn't feel scary. It didn't feel like manhandling. It didn't even feel like anything dangerous. It felt like something else altogether, and she wasn't sure whether what there was a word for it, except... The heat in her belly felt familiar. When she was young, it had bloomed in her chest, and like a bright white hope that seemed to guide her ever, whatever the situation, it had burned the hottest to her in her chest at his engagement party when then she had been so desperate to stop him from making a terrible mistake. She had never known such an injustice that Everett McCall hadn't even been able to wait one more year for her to be grown up so that they could have had a chance, just a chance. That was all she wanted, but she always had to be racing against some kind of clock given that he was a decade her senior, and of course, of course, some woman had fallen in love with him. Lila, Lila had even fallen in love with him when she'd been a girl, but the least that Everett could have done, the very damn least, was wait until she could be on a complete level of playing field, just one more year until she was eighteen, and then she could have kissed him. But now that feeling was situated lower in her belly and blooming outwardly, blooming down. You could kiss him now, in her thoughts. Angry, grumpy Everett McCall, who had now been married and divorced, had given up on love with her, a blushing virgin, but maybe even that was it. He wasn't the one he couldn't be. If he was the one, they wouldn't be one to kill each other on sight after all this time. If he was the one, it would feel sweet and airy and glorious, not like this dark, gnawing desire that nearly hurt. But he was a something. She didn't need to be with, one, with only one man, but she needed it to be significant. And for her, Everett McCall was significant in every way. Somehow, as she rose up on her toes just then, she felt like she was tipping forward off the edge of something. And when her lips met his, it was like an explosion. Okay, when I come back, we are hitting page 346.